Hello, this is Professor David Bishai, and I'm here to present a lecture on U.S. health insurance. There are four parts to this lecture, and this will be the video that contains part one. The first part will be to discuss the problem of rising costs, and the second part of the lecture will discuss the Medicare program in the United States. Part three goes over Medicaid, and part four goes over managed care. So let's launch into part one. The overall structure is to show how the problem of high costs and rising costs has led to a variety of federal initiatives to help restrain rising costs as one of the main objectives of healthcare policy. There are, of course, other objectives of health policy besides controlling costs. One obviously wants to make the population healthy and to limit out-of-pocket payments, uh, to do risk protection, to treat people with dignity. However, uh, the problem of rising costs is, of course, an objective, and many of the federal regulations and developments in Medicare, Medicaid, and managed care have been focused on this particular problem. So it's important to discuss uh, how we got to this problem of high costs and rising costs in healthcare. So let's launch into this topic. The two ideas here are that there were both high costs and over time that the costs rise very fast. The idea of high costs isn't that they're just high, but that the costs are not worth it. And we have to develop a criteria to tell if it's not worth it. How do we tell that waste is a problem will be the first lesson. And then the question related to that is if costs are growing too fast, how fast is too fast? How do we know that the rapid pace of health cost growth is not good and not sustainable. So it's it's just not a matter to say, well, costs are high, it's a problem, costs are growing, it's a problem. There are criteria. Let's talk about it. Here is a common situation. Joe uh, spends $20 on his fancy schmancy gourmet cheese, and Mary spends $2 on her Velveeta. And most economists would say, this is not a problem. Joe likes cheese, and Mary likes Velveeta, so the Latin saying, de gustibus non est disputandum, let people buy what they want. That intense uh, love of consumer autonomy and respect for the individual that comes with liberalism uh, wants us to apply that same criteria to whole nations. So when we see a country spending a lot of money on its health care, there's this knee-jerk to say, not a problem. That's what they want to do. So let's look at healthcare spending in an in international context. Here is per capita health spending as of 2018 across about 30, 35 countries. Uh, healthcare costs adjusted for purchasing power parity per capita are on the vertical axis. And set of countries is on the horizontal axis with their names. And you can see way out on the far right is India spending $209 per person per year. Uh, the average for this set of OECD countries is $3,994 per capita per year. And in the U.S., the, the total is an outlier. We're spending $10,586 per person per year. Uh, on health care. And de gustibus non est disputandum. We want to spend that much. Leave us alone. The Indian people want to spend $209. We'll come into reasons why richer countries spend more money. Uh, but the U.S. is not the richest country on this list. Uh, Luxembourg is, and they just don't spend as much on their health. So we do spend a lot of money on health care. But that alone is not going to turn out to, to, to win the argument that this is a problem. Uh, let's express the same data on not per capita, but as a share of the gross domestic product. So here we see that India spends 3.6% of its gross domestic product. India is living at the far right. Uh, Indonesia, 3.1%. But on the far left, uh, the USA is still an outlier. We spend uh, close to 17% of our GDP on health care. That means if you get a dollar of income in America, 17 cents is going to go to pay for health care in, in your country, in America. 
uh, and you only have 83 cents to spend on all the other things you might want. Now, health isn't bad, good to spend something on it, but the average citizen in an OECD country is spending what the red bar says and spending only 8.8%. And so we're spending almost double uh, the average of rich modern countries uh, on health care. Now let's talk a little about one reason to worry that this is the right amount of money to spend on health care. Let's talk about what we're getting for that money. So here is something that I'm going to call a global health production function. I'm going to call it a health production function because on the horizontal axis is, is health spending in the year 2011. And on the vertical axis is the life expectancy of a country in 2011. So I've labeled the countries with their three letter uh, initials and you can see the USA on the far right. So to read that off, in the US, uh, Americans pay in 2011 $8,508 per person per year, and they got a life expectancy of 78.7 years. So we already know we spend more than, than everyone else, but this curve is showing that in terms of getting life expectancy out of the health dollars, uh, we are not performing any better than all of the other rich countries that are having life expectancies close to 80. In fact, we're performing worse than many of the countries with life expectancy uh, uh, above 80. Uh, Greece, Israel, Korea, Portugal, Slovenia, they're paying uh, less than $3,000 per person per year, and they all have higher life expectancies than the USA. These are poor countries. Uh, some of them are. Certainly Greece uh, and Portugal have lower GDPs per capita. So in terms of social determinants, they have a disadvantage and they're still outgunning us on their life expectancy. In terms of cost worthy, we're spending more um, and then we're not getting life expectancy. So we're spending about $5,000 extra compared to Korea, Israel, Greece, etc. And we're getting the same or worse life expectancy as those other countries. It means we are taking that $5,000 and getting no life expectancy. We're getting less health. And now you ask the question, you know, de gustibus non est disputandum. We must be getting, hopefully, something other than health for those $5,000 related to spending. Now, we can spend money in the health sector for things that are not health. Uh, you can spend money simply for risk protection, let's say. Uh, insurance offers risk protection. It is also a way to move money from your healthy self to your sick self. So that's a reason to want to spend more money than you're getting in terms of life expectancy. Another thing that you can do with your health budget is to correct health disparities, to intensify the spending on underprivileged and minority groups. And if America were getting great solutions to health disparities, we'd say, yeah, of course we want to spend more because we, we love our minorities and that's what we want to do. But I'm being ironic here because America is not and uh, a world performer in correcting health disparities. We might be getting great things that are not making us live longer, but making us feel better about ourselves. We might be getting great plastic surgery. We might be taking care of our disabilities and helping people um, solve their morbidity and sickness problems, although we don't, we don't live longer. That, that could be true. Uh, but uh, plastic surgery is, is paid for out of pocket and not so much by health insurance. Another thing that the money in the health sector goes for is putting art galleries and public sculpture in our hospital lobbies, wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. We might have very, very beautiful hospitals for this money. Or we might be getting short waiting times. We might be having very respectful and dignified encounters with our physicians. And even though they don't make us live longer, we love the respect and the dignity so much that we're willing to spend the extra money. So those are the, the justifications for that $5,000 per year, but there's a sense of cynicism and irony that we're doing it right, that this is good job, America, that $5,000 is giving the American people value. So when we go back to what is the right amount of money to spend on health, we've covered this uh, in prior lectures in this course. Um, you've seen this machinery on how an economist answers the question, what is the right amount of money to spend on health care and, and on health? Uh, we have a production possibility frontier in black, 
we have a social welfare function and difference curve in blue, and we say the intersection is the socially optimum um, amount of health to have. Once we know how healthy we as a people want to be, we go over to our health production function in the left quadrant, and that tells us how much money to spend as we drop the vertical line down to the health spending axis. So that's the, the right answer. The problem, as I think you'll believe after we've seen the, the poor life expectancy in the USA, is that America is not on the production possibility frontier. We're spending money, we're giving up consumption opportunities, we're giving up $5,000 worth of consumption opportunities, moving ourselves backwards on our consumption opportunities, and we did not get what we should have gotten uh, in terms of the health that other countries have gotten uh, in Greece, Israel, Korea, etc. So the problem is that our production function is, is not the optimal one. We have a wasteful, inefficient health production function on the left, and that, that purple curve is showing the diminished expectations. Given this purple health production function, you'll see that it simply doesn't offer us point A on the production possibility frontier of the world. The world must have a better non-wasteful health production function that the USA doesn't have, allowing it to get up technically to point A, and we're not there. So as long as we have a wasteful production function and we're underperforming inside the production possibility frontier, then our world looks like um, the dotted indifference curve. We're stuck at this indifference curve at point A tilde, wishing we could get up to A star, but we can't. While we're stuck down here at A tilde, uh, some political individuals might say, you know, I really don't get a lot of utility at point A tilde. I'd rather go to point B where I have more money and, and even less health. If you look at point B, more money, less health. Let's do cost control in health care. Let's put on big co-pays and big deductibles so that people don't spend as much money on health care. And they might deny themselves from necessary care, but will spend less on care. That would be a policy option down at point A tilde. And to some degree, it might improve social welfare, but it is not the optimum. It doesn't even get us any closer to A star. Uh, if we focus on cost control as the problem, we're wandering around inside the production possibility frontier, ignoring the massive problem in the left quadrant, that we have that wasteful production function of health that's sitting there keeping us away from the social optimum, robbing us of that $5,000 of money that the people in Greece and Israel and Korea don't have to waste on getting nothing. So what do we do? Uh, we certainly are ending up doing cost control measures that give us worse health and, and more money. Um, but I think you'll see what a better solution might be um, in terms of whether we should do plan A or plan B. There's a better option. That better option is to get out of that wasteful production function, do a system adaptation that puts us back on the international health production function that somebody in Korea and Israel uh, and Greece must figure, have figured out that allows them to get up to not wasting so much money in the health sector. So if we were able to adapt, do a system adaptation, a brand new plan, we would now have, really have the, the ability to reach the production possibility frontier of the planet, and then we could achieve not A tilde, but we could get up to A star. We could say, we want to be at A star, and we would actually have that dotted purple uh, health production function that will allow us to, to get there uh, at less health spending, perhaps, but certainly more health and more consumption opportunities. So these are considerations that say if you look at the U.S. in international context, we're spending more and getting not life expectancy, but something else. And no one I've ever asked could tell us exactly what that is. It's not art galleries. It's not corrected social disparities. It's not great risk protection. Um, it sure is rich doctors and drug company executives. 
uh, and you know, maybe we could go into the political economy to explain what we're doing, but we're not acting like a good economist would. So if wasteful production is the problem, as, as I assert that it is, uh, you know, let's talk about our production process. Let's break it down and ask uh, ourselves, look at the inputs. Are these wasteful inputs and what adaptations would we consider to try to get on that uh, global production possibility frontier that the other uh, countries in the OECD are somehow uh, getting implemented? So let's first break down where uh, we get health dollars. Uh, if we look at the the Center for Medicare and Medicaid, uh, they've broken out where we get health dollars from. This big orange segment says that 75% of the nation's health dollar, and there are 3.6 trillion health dollars, that's what 17% of the GDP is, uh, these 3.6 trillion health dollars, three quarters of them come from health insurance plans. Uh, those are Medicare, Medicaid, and private health insurance. So 34% are private health insurance for people who are under 65 and, and not low income. 21% is Medicare. 10% uh, of it is Medicaid uh, uh, federal. 6% is Medicaid local. And then there's a variety of uh, Veterans Administration, Department of Defense. So health insurance accounts for the lion's share. And of that, it's mostly public. Uh, the 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 green private set of health insurance is is less than half of the health insurance dollar. Where else do we get health dollars from? We get them from this blue segment of savings. People sometimes pay for health out of savings uh, and investments. Um, this orange segment called out of pocket is ten percent. Uh, of us buying drugs over the counter or paying chiropractors out of pocket, buying our own plastic surgeries. I put in a, in a, a yellow star the 3% gray wedge of governmental public health activities. This is direct tax payment for state and local health departments. 80% of public health is state and local and 20% is federal spending on the Centers for Disease Control, uh, the FDA and other uh, federal agencies that make us have public health. So the money mostly comes to pay for private goods. That big orange health insurance payment, uh, the out-of-pocket payment, the 5%, 97% of the health dollar is being spent for private rival excludable goods where I get a health event, you can't have it. I take a pill, you can't take the pill. It's driven by private demand uh, and private acts of consumption. So that's where we get the health dollars. And because they're coming from people who want to have the good they paid for, you really can't get public health out of it. You can only get public health activities out of that 3% uh, of tax revenue allocated to that. So we look at the health spending. Look at the left pie, and the biggest part of the, the where we spend dollars on producing health is inside hospitals. 33% of our health dollar goes to hospitals to take care of very sick people who are so sick they can't even be in their own houses. 20% uh, of the health dollar is spending on doctors uh, and clinics. Going to your, your family doctor, going to an emergency room or a clinic uh, is sitting in the orange segment. So. 20% plus 33%, 53% of the health dollar for, for clinical services. Going around the pie, you see some dental care at 4%, other professional services, 3%. Prescription drugs making up about 10% of the health dollar. Uh, nursing homes making up 5% of the health dollar. We've got governmental uh, administration at 8%, and then investments in the, the future of health uh, investing in new research, etc., is 5%. Now we're going to break out the 14% orange pie of other. Inside other, at 14% is the pie on the right, and you'll see there that we have residential and personal care. These are uh, uh, residential rehab, uh, residential uh, nursing homes. We have home health care at 3%, uh, non-durable medical products at 2%, and public health activities at 3% uh, total. So that public goods part of the, the health dollar pie is only 3% as we saw before on the revenue side. 
So that's what we spend our dollars on. That's what we're spending. It's too much. It doesn't appear to be cost worthy. Uh, we're seeing that most of that money is being spent on uh, clinical services, home care, residential care, and only 3% on the public goods inputs into what makes us healthy. Let's move now to not just the size of, of health care, but the, uh, the growth of health care. The, the orange curve here shows us how we got to spending $3.5 trillion on health. So the, the left vertical axis gets you up to $3.5 trillion spent on health, and the orange curve rises from $25 billion per, per nation per year in 1961, rising over time to reach the level um, of $3.5 trillion. The blue bars are read off of the right side of the vertical axis, and those are growth rates. They are not proportions of the pie. They are the percentage growth rate, the, growth, the, the level this year minus the level last year, divided by the level last year, how much you grow in a year. So the growth rate in blue has been running, you can see it starting in 1961, at about 7.5%. You see it peaking in about 1981 at about 15 to 16 percent per year uh, of, a, of a growth rate of health spending. Comes down in the 1990s to about 6 percent again. It comes down in the 2010s to about 4 to 5 percent, and it ends the series on the far right at about 5% per year. So we have this sector of the economy growing at rates that run from 6 to 16 and now currently about 5% per year. Is that scary to you? Is it scary to see a part of the economy grow at 4 to 16%? Well, for sure, a sector growing at 16% is, is horrifying. And we'll see that the people in the 19, early 1980s were horrified to watch healthcare spending grow by 16%. And they, they went into the, the 80s trying to fix that super high part of growth. But how do we know if health spending is growing too fast? Well, one way to know is to compare healthcare growth, healthcare spending growth to GDP growth. GDP growth is how fast the entire economy is growing. And that's being shown to you in these grayish brown bars. Uh, health spending is still the same. Those orange bars are the same as they were. You see they're still reaching up to 16% in the 1980s and so on. So now you have uh, an eyeball task to do. I want you to take a minute and go ahead and count how many years the orange bar was lower than the brown bar. Because right here in 1961, the orange bar is growing twice as fast as the brown bar. Healthcare spending is growing twice as fast as the economy. In 1962, it's growing about uh, one-fifth faster. But go through. I'll give you a minute because there's a quiz question coming next where you have to count the number of times the orange bar is not higher than. How many times is the, the GDP in brown higher than health spending in orange. Take a minute. What you saw when you counted was that healthcare spending has been growing faster than the GDP for most of the last 56 years, only about uh, nine or ten times uh, did GDP grow faster. So healthcare sector is going to grow as a proportion of the economy, and now no wonder it's 17 percent of the economy because it's been the part of the economy that's growing faster than the whole economy. How do we know whether or not this is the right level and the right rate of growth? One consideration is that we need the GDP and health to grow together. They are complementary inputs in health production. 
So what we've seen in the past when we've looked at these production possibility frontiers, I've only shown you the pieces of the frontier that are in this mini quadrant up here. So you've seen them well behave. There's none of this pooching out. But in reality, there are parts of the health production possibility frontier that are not well behaved. Here, on this upper left part of the curve, you can get more consumption by increasing mm -hmm. your health, that they are complementary inputs into health production. To the left of the, the middle bar, you're really so sick that you, you can't be as productive as you could be, and so investing in health gives you more consumption opportunities. And on the far bottom right, you're seeing that they're so poor that they need to grow their economy to get the health they need to grow the economy more. So there are pieces of the health production process where both consumption and health are complementary inputs into production. Furthermore, health and GDP are complementary goods in utility. As I'll say in another minute, people find that being healthy makes their consumption taste and feel better. So they don't want to go from utility curve uh, one with this combination of, of consumption and health. The only way to make them have higher utility is to get equal proportions of more consumer goods and more health together. That getting more consumer goods and staying sick is not as fun and getting more health and not as many consumer goods is not as fun. You want to get them both together. They're complementary. And one way to say that in math is to uh, say that healthy, being healthy is a universal complement to all consumption. So if instead of saying the uh, utility of health and consumption is some I don't know what, here I'm saying that the utility of health and consumption has a specific complementary functional form. Yes, utility depends on a term that comes from health, health to the alpha. Yes, utility depends on C, C to the beta. But it also depends on the product of C and health, that H going up without C isn't as good as health, H and C going up together. And that comes out of the Grossman model. The richer people are, it makes them want to be even more healthy because health uh, is a universal complement. So as we get richer, we want to be healthier. We want to be healthier. We invest money in health capital. And so we would expect spending to rise, health spending to rise along with, with consumption. So all countries should see health spending grow as their economies grow. We would expect that GDP per capita and health spending per capita should grow together. Unfortunately, what we've seen in the U.S. is that the health spending grew faster. And that's a pity because the health production function we seem to have used in the USA was wasteful. So what was growing must have been stuff that wasn't making us have a longer life expectancy. Now, because of this cost growth and wastefulness, uh, we've gotten to the point where uh, health spending now takes up 17% of the US GDP. Now, you can look at this curve and say the glass is half empty. My God, it's growing and growing. And if we extrapolate this line for another 10 years, we're going to hit 20% uh, of the GDP in healthcare. Or you could be an optimist and say, no, this looks fine. We turned the corner in 2009, and now we're flat, and it's not going to get worse. We're going to restrain health spending share of the US GDP. So whether the we've turned the corner or not, great question. Whether we're turning the corner because we're restraining only the wasteful spending or whether we've decided to lower costs and lower health together is a terrific question. Because during the 2010s, US life expectancy went down for three years during the decade. So we, we may have flattened this curve, but we sure didn't seem to make progress in our epidemics of opioids, suicide, and alcohol deaths. So not sure this is, this is something to celebrate, but it is um, a question whether or not we permanently bent the US spending share of US GDP curve. Part of what we wanna cover is what makes healthcare costs grow? What has made them grow all the way up to 17%? And we're gonna decompose, what we decomposed before was where does the health dollar come from and where does it go? 
This question is, where does the growth point come from and where does it go? What makes healthcare costs get bigger over time? Okay, I hope you realize the distinction. We're not counting up where the dollar is. We're counting up where did the growth of the dollar come from? What is the increment accounted for? So if, in the Rice and Unruh uh, book, The Economics of, of Health Reconsidered, um, if you go to page 388 and 401, there's a, a section on, on this topic, and I'm going to summarize some of what um, is commonly known about the decomposition of healthcare cost growth. Spending is obviously the product of the price times the quantity. If quantity had never changed, then it would have been simple, but for sure, prices have gotten bigger. So unit prices have increased in the healthcare sector. Drug prices are higher, uh, nursing salaries, doctor salaries are higher. The machinery, the CT scanners and MRI machines are more expensive. So prices are rising. And part of the reason we'll come to in the course is that a lot of the drugs uh, are uh, owned by monopolists, licensed by by people with not much competition, and when they have monopoly power, uh, they can charge very high prices, and the only solution to a monopolist is someone with monopsony buying power that says, I am the only market for your product, I'm not going to pay your monopoly price. So we'll, we'll cover that later. Uh, and in the U.S., we have not fully realized the, op the opportunities to use the nation as the monopsony buyer. Uh, the second reason is that the, the units being used, price times quantity, well, the quantity isn't the same in the 21st century as it was in the 20th century. Uh, the drugs are better, the tests are better, the procedures are better. And when they become better, the more of those better things we use, they're going to have higher prices. They're better, they should cost more. And when we substitute uh, better products for old but less good products, we're going to have higher costs because we're substituting uh, better stuff, better inputs for the old inputs. And in the U.S., because insurance is a third-party payer, they never say no to, to new technology. And in other countries, the nation says, yeah, I see that's a better thing, but the U.K. isn't going to buy it. We're just not going to use that approach to healthcare. We're going to use this older, cheaper approach. For instance, um, in insulin, the 20-year-old the, the insulin products out there uh, work great, and you could get terrific control of your diabetes with uh, $10 a vial insulin. Nowadays, highly engineered, uh, molecularly designed insulin products are standard in the U.S. We've said yes to all of the uh, the the, the highly synthetic insulins, and you know, diabetes is still diabetes. It, it uh, life expectancy for diabetes uh, patients has not dramatically increased, although spending has increased. So we never say no to technology. Another option for healthcare costs, as you know, loading charges and administration is inside every health dollar, and we'll talk soon in about a billings arms race between providers and payers. The provider side, there's an army of billers and coders trying to optimize every dollar of payment. So now there's new people that we have to pay for simply to haggle over the health care bill. Uh, the final uh, two ideas, if your population got bigger, well, obviously uh, not on a per capita basis, but on a total basis, they're going to be spending more. But we've already adjusted per capita and we're spending more per capita. If your population is getting older or getting sicker, well, then they're going to get more utilization, and America is getting older and getting sicker, and so we have to decompose uh, those factors, and we'll see that in just a second. Final reason to think about is that if we keep focusing on the private goods part of health production with disease treatments, and you know we are, I showed you where the health dollar is going, 97% is going on disease treatment, 3% on public health, we might be using health production technology that is prone to grow because it's in an area where there are growing prices and growing technology, whereas in public health uh, technology, you don't have those growing prices uh, <clears throat> and high tech. A paper by Dielman uh, in JAMA in 2016 did the decomposition of spending growth across five factors. They asked 
uh, about how much did healthcare spending grow as a function of first population size, and they found uh, population size accounted for a fair amount of growth. Um, not surprising. Obviously, that would go away on a per capita basis. Population aging accounted for about a hundred billion dollars extra growth in the health care bill. About hundred billion out of three point five trillion. Um, that's not so amazing. Um, disease prevalence and incidence was not an explanation for why the health spending grew from 1996 to 2013 nor was utilization. Americans are uh, not having sufficient increases in hospitalization rates uh, or outpatient visits to explain this, this massive growth, 5 to 6% uh, growth rate between 96 and 2013. The big factor that accounted for almost $600 billion of the, the growth of health spending was both a combination of higher prices and those higher prices coming because the product was more intense, more uh, high tech. You're using the, the molecularly substituted insulin rather than the old insulin and all the price went up. So price isn't just going up for the same old thing. Price is going up and the product is getting technically better. However, life expectancy is not going up. So amazing insulin, we pay more, but we get the same life expectancy. So it's not a win. Uh, it's a win for the drug company and for the tech, but it's not a win for life expectancy. Francis Collins, who's running the National Institutes of Health, is taking American tax money and inventing brand new amazing technology that we're all paying for. So Francis Collins, if you're listening, you know, I'm not so sure that the NIH has been a great investment. It's making amazing, amazing healthcare technology. And if you have diabetes, lucky you, you get to use fancy insulin. But you don't get to live longer. Well, so why can't the NIH study a better health production function? Good question. Part of it is who's running the NIH? Bunch of people in white coats with um, uh, PCR machines and centrifuges. Let's talk about where that service price and intensity went. So we talked about the the increments, and if you remember, the big thing was service price and intensity. The service price and intensity bump in America has been concentrated mostly inside hospitals. If you see on the second uh, bar, the red component is the growth of service price and intensity. It's been primarily an inpatient story, but uh, the top bar, ambulatory care, has certainly had a a tremendous chunk of growth of service price and intensity. Pharmaceuticals prices have gone up a fair amount because of price and intensity, but also now it's time to talk about the green bar where we've used more drugs. So part of why we're spending more is because we're using more drugs. We're using more ambulatory care, but less inpatient care. And so at the end of the day, service utilization wasn't a big factor in why we're spending more on health care. Um, but the service price and intensity, primarily in hospital services, being more costly and more better, uh, has been driving the growth of healthcare uh, spending in the U.S. Prices and intensity growing most in hospitals. We're having a substitution from less inpatient utilization, fewer admissions, fewer days inside our American hospitals, because you can see the green bar is to the left of zero. And we're having more outpatient visits. We're moving patient care from inside hospitals to outside hospitals, seeing our, our outpatient doctors more. So the decomposition graphs, in summary, are showing that prices and intensity are driving U.S. costs, and that is an inside hospital problem happening for the sickest people. They're getting higher tech services that cost us more. You saw it also happening, that red stuff of higher prices and intensity is happening in ambulatory care, in pharmaceuticals, and in emergency rooms. And as I indicated earlier, part of why that's happening is that private health insurance systems have trouble saying no whenever the FDA approves any brand new tech. A better insulin, uh, the insurance company puts it on the formulary. They feel that if they don't allow it on the formulary, they will lose market share. So we don't say no. If it's effective, FDA approved, it's going to go in. 
other countries don't do that. Uh, and they have some political system that says, yeah, sure, we don't have to pay for that stupid, crazy, high expensive stuff. Um, maybe if you lower the price, we'll buy it, but we're not going to buy it at that price. Um, in the U.S., for political reasons, as well as perhaps our political economy, we've told uh, uh, drug companies, you bring it on, we'll pay for it. We won't allow Medicare to do uh, price negotiations. We won't allow Medicaid to do price negotiations uh, with drug companies or with any tech company. So if you're a U.S. insurance company, you could say, well, you know, Glaxo, we're a big insurance company, and if you want us to buy your insulin, um, please mark it down by 15%. We'll, we'll sign up for your insulin instead of your competitor's insulin. So you can get a little bit of a price concession. But if you say, we're the nation of the United Kingdom, we're all of Japan, and I'm the Japanese government, and I say to Glaxo, look, I'm not going to buy your insulin. You better mark it down. You can get a way bigger price negotiation because you're representing the entire market of your country. Okay, I wanted to go over uh, another reason there could be high prices. We've talked about technical substitution. If the product is better and it's being covered by a monopolist, of course, its price will go up. Um, William Baumol, an economist uh, from Princeton, invented the concept of Baumol disease. It's not a medical disease, it's an economic disease. And Baumol wants us to think about uh, a simple story of two goods. Supposing we lived in an economy that the only thing that people wanted to buy was corn and string quartets. And the only way they made corn and string quartets was labor and capital. So they could either allocate labor and capital making string quartets or making corn, and they want to have some combination of both. Okay, in this country, the story goes, there was some technical innovation, someone invented fertilizer and tractors, and so the farmers now become more productive, but no one invented technical change for string quartet. So now the farmer is so much more productive. A farmer with an acre used to make 100 bushels of corn, now they make 1,000 bushels of corn. Good job, farmers. But because um, violins and cellos are the same, we did not improve their, their productivity. The four musicians still make one string quartet per hour. This is the same old 500-year-old technology. So Baumol points out that in this economy, the farmer who has uh, been able to become more productive now uh, will have to spend more on capital than on labor. Uh, he is not going to have as much of a wage increase as the musicians who are now uh, much more critical to produce this other major good in the economy. The, the economy wants to have, you know, let's say 10% of its um, allocation of its budget to string quartets. The musicians are in super high demand. No one needs farmers as much anymore, and their wages are going to go down. The musicians' wages are going to go up because they did not innovate and they stayed unproductive. So your wages go up if uh, there are no capital innovations in your sector. So this is a, a story about uh, prices going up in the non-innovative sector of an economy. The question for health economists has been, does this apply to healthcare? Does Baumol disease apply to healthcare? Now, Baumol thought a little bit about this and he says, looks like it's like string quartets. Um, doctor visits are like string quartets. You go to the doctor, what do you do? You, there's this guy in a white coat, he has a stethoscope, this 100-year-old thing, and he makes you lie down on an exam table and he talks to you. It's the same old thing, like a string quartet. And Baumol asks, has technical change made an outpatient visit more productive of health? Well, some say no, but some say yes. A doctor uh, who has the ability to prescribe amazing insulin or an amazing CT scan could potentially give you more health per visit. He's not like a violinist. However, when you look at studies of life expectancy per thousand doctor visits, you just don't see the same effect. So on a micro basis, one doctor visit for one person with appendicitis will save the guy with appendicitis' life. But overall, if you see a million people going to more and more, 10% more doctor visits, you really are not going to have easy time seeing an improvement in life, life expectancy. More to the point, we already know that most of the problem with American health care costs isn't in doctor visits. It's in drug prices and inpatient services. And for sure, a hospital stay 
is not like a violin string quartet. There's machines everywhere, high-tech EKG monitors and ventilators and uh, endoscopies. It's not the same old thing. Of course, there's innovation there. So the Balmol explanation is is out there in the literature. I wanted to make you aware of it, but I didn't want you to say, well, that's the obvious answer to why healthcare costs are rising. So wrapping up, um, we see that America has many problems with its health system. In the cost setting, the problems have been high costs, costs that don't translate well into better life expectancy, and rising costs that are rising faster than the GDP per capita most years for the last 50 or 60 years. How does the U.S. fix these things? Well, in the U.S., some of the major ways to, to, to adapt the health system have come through major U.S. programs, Medicare and Medicaid. So that's what we're going to talk about in the next lecture. Also, the American federal government has made new rules about managed care and about medical spending accounts as a way to help control costs. There are also ways to get us onto a better health production function using public health. And I'll talk about that not in, in this lecture, but in a later lecture. So I wanted to thank you for tuning in to part one. Uh, please come back for parts two, three, and four of this lecture on the U.S. health system.